Morning, ladies and gents. My name is Simon Brown, doing intros for this evening, not doing the presentation. Uh, that will be Keith McLachlan, and he's talking of how managers can mislead you. Thanks, Simon. First of all, can everyone hear me? Yes. Awesome. Uh, thanks for braving the cold. It would have been quite boring to talk to an empty room. Uh, yes, this is how management can mislead you. So, ah, oh, there we go, moving. So, that, let's start off with the agenda. Um, it's, it's quite simple. Right up front, I'll tell you what this presentation is not about, because that's quite important to the fun. And then we can go into something that sounds really, really boring, but it's quite important to, to understand, to understand how management can circumvent it or manipulate it, um, sometimes unwillingly uh, or unwittingly, sometimes very much intentionally. Um, and then we move into a whole lot of uh, ways they can. Also understand that this is a broad topic. It can get incredibly technical. And at the same time, it's always changing. Uh, if you remember, there was a small company a couple of years ago called Enron. They invented a whole lot of things that accounting standards were written to prevent. So it's, it's a moving target. But we'll touch on the current ways that, that I'm aware of, and I think the most more pertinent uh, ones. And we'll just run off, run off a list um, and uh, jump to something I like to call the golden rule. Summarize it all and uh, open for questions. Uh, this, like I said, this can be quite technical and it can get quite long-winded. So what I will do is keep it light and, and try to get through it all so we have plenty of time for questions. If there's anything in particular you want me to go into in depth, please let me know. So jumping over to what this presentation is not about. So this presentation is about how management can legally, legally, that's a very big word, very important word, use and justify using facts and clever disclosure to mislead investors. It's, it's legal, and it's more common than, than you might be aware of. Uh, unless you're a conspiracy theorist, then it is probably less common than you, are, than you think it is. But this question is not about how management law, which is effectively fraud, and that is illegal. That's not what we're talking about today. Everything and the examples I use in this presentation are all legal. They will not send anyone to jail and they are entirely subjective whether you agree with them or disagree with them. They are not fraud. Um, but there is a very big difference between something being legal and something being moral. <coughs> Just before I move on, my little disclaimer, don't sue me, I'm a really nice guy. <laughs> IFRS and everything else. So IFRS is now, the financial results that you guys read that listed companies publish are built by accountants. Accountants in South Africa are driven by a framework called IFRS, the International fin Financial Reporting Standards. And the way it works is there's an international accounting body that decides what the accounting rules are. They then hand them out to countries and our local uh, 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 accounting body has decided to adopt IFRS. They then take these standards, largely uh, 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 hand them down to, to our industry to use, uh, maybe adapt one or two and have interpretations and the like because every country and company and uh, industry is different. But that's the important part about IFRS. And by the way, America is the exception here, much like the metric system, they do their own thing. So um, ignore America for this argument. Um, the rest of the world pretty much uses IFRS. The important thing about this is that these rules that define how transactions are accounted for, that transactions are the heart of business, that how when you sell something, how you recognize it, when you buy something, how you recognize it, and how you disclose it, and how all of that trickles down into cash flow statement, income statement, and balance sheet is dictated by the same set of rules that everybody else is using and that you yourself have used for many years makes, th makes them consistent, makes this set of financials consistent. So I can compare this set of financials by this company to last year's set of financials by this company to the last 10 years set of financials by this company. Because if you chop and change the rules every year, well, this year is not comparable to last year. This allows the comparability of, uh, above it, uh, of it. Um, and it allows it to be comparable to other companies. 
So if ABC company, without the first, if ABC company decided to uh, account for something totally differently to XYZ company, yet there was actually the same transaction, you can't compare those two things. So the one might show profits, the one might show losses, but who cares because you don't know and it's not accounted for the same way. So IFRS, the most important thing is it makes financial results and financial statements consistent and comparable and world over. Once again, excluding America. Um, it does this by limiting the creative interpretation because they are rules. Um, and within this, though, there are relatively important estimates and assumptions that management need to make. And now you can start to see how the door starts to sneak open for creative accounting because the moment you've got estimates and assumptions, well, well management can start to change those estimates and assumptions. And even within the rules, the numbers start to change. But the important thing is they apply the rules. Now, anything outside of IFRS is not IFRS and is generally speaking not audited. There are things, niche standards like SAMRAC for mineral resources and the like that are, but that's getting into very specialized talk. And like I said, I'm going to keep this quite light. So anything that is not IFRS, is not audited, makes it not consistent and not comparable. Unless you do a lot of work and you make sure that you're comfortable that it is, but as a rule of thumb, it is not consistent and it is not comparable. Hence, half of the stuff we're going to be talking about tonight is not IFRS. And then I'm going to show you a couple of ways where IFRS can be moved around to suit management. So that's IFRS and everything else. We'll jump straight into probably in, in the modern day and age on the JSC, one of the more common ways to make a company's results look good. Now, it's important to understand that sometimes this is not done to make a company's results look good. It is done because management are trying to show a true and illustrative picture of how this company is operating and how it's actually performing. That said, you get adjusted earnings measures. IFRS dictates that earnings, i.e. profits per share, there are only these measures. There are only earnings per share, headline earnings per share, diluted earnings per share and headline earnings per share, and continuing and discontinued measures of those. There is nothing else. Nothing else. Anything else that has any other name that any management team ever tries to show you as an earnings per share measure that is not some combination of those names is an adjusted earnings measure, it is not IFRS. So it begs the question then, what is it? So, well, it's manufactured by management and that's why I call it broadly adjusted earnings measures, but it can be called core earnings, underlying earnings, reoccurring earnings, normalized earnings is quite a popular one. Um, but is that good or bad? Well, like I said, first of all, management sometimes actually do this to try to show you because IFRS has its limitations and accounting gets messy and sometimes there are a lot of entries that may or may not be real um, and may or, may or may not reflect business as is actually happening. So management sometimes are really, really nice guys and they want to show us that actually, you know, accounting says this, but we think the underlying uh, performance of the business is something else. So you have to ask the question is, when, when they do this, do they disclose it? Do they just quote adjusted earnings and not tell you how they arrived at it? If they don't tell you how they arrived at it, you can't trust it because you don't know what it is. Then, if they do disclose it, just because they disclose it doesn't actually make it the correct earnings. So ask the question, do you agree with the things they've taken out? Just a, just a little bit of skepticism goes a long way here. Um, something that's quite interesting is because it's not IFRS, you can change this definition. The moment you change something in IFRS, there are rules. When it comes to things outside of IFRS, you can change this year on year and you don't have to go and change the previous one or even tell anyone you've changed it. So ask not just do they disclose how they make it and do you agree with how they make it, but do they change it every year? Um, and here's another and final important point is because it is manufactured and not rules based, you can't go and take one company's core earnings and compare it to another company's normalized earnings and a third company's underlying earnings. Those are very, very different metrics 
they are not comparable. So that's the background to adjusted earnings. Sounds, I'll, I'll be honest, sounds a bit dry, and we'll get, let's get into some, like a, a case study I have, but how important is that? So here's, here's an estimation on my behalf, and I just did it in the last month and extrapolated it across the JSE, and you know, I search, search for certain keywords across all the sends on the JSE, and I may get hits and misses. So this is an estimation, it's not, not accurate, but it gives us a good sense. 14 companies in just the last five days, I made this a couple days ago, 14 listed companies reported either adjusted, normalized, or core. I didn't even search for underlying and various reoccurring and other names. 14 companies. Over the last month, 70 companies. The JSC has, I could stand corrected, 408 listed companies. You can extrapolate this to roughly a quarter to a fifth of the entire JSC reports adjusted, normalized, or changed earnings that are not IFRS based. That's a big sample. If you're looking at five companies, the odds are at least one of them, you're gonna to have to make a call on adjusted earnings. Do you agree with it? Or do you disagree with it? And is it a good or a bad thing? So my point is it's relevant, uh, I believe. Then we get to company A. Um, I'm not a big fan of lawsuits. So I've taken the names out. Uh, if the names slip, I apologize, because these are real companies, they do exist. And I'm sure if you apply your intelligence, you can go and find out which ones they are. Um, but it's real world examples. First of all, um, I've simplified them. There's always a lot more in context than this. But for the purposes of, uh, of this presentation, it works as a, uh, as, as a good example. So you get company A. Now, Company A for many, many years showed what are called normalized earnings number. And what is interesting was they didn't just show it, they emphasized it. I'm talking in all their highlights, first line item, normalized earnings, and all their trading updates, normalized earnings is doing this, and all their presentations, normalized earnings, and then because it's FRS and they have to disclose it, they, they put headline earnings and EPS and the like, and, but it's there and it's, it's lower down. And, you know, if you're lazy and the first thing you look at is the, is the highlight, that's what you see. And that's what I talk about emphasizing. Um, just as a, a matter of aside, in terms of Google search results, the hit ratio drops to 5% on the second page. So 95% only look at the first, page of, of, uh, the first page of Google search results. In fact, the hit ratio drops to 20% if you're below the first couple line items, i.e. it's called uh, below the fold, you actually have to scroll your screen down. Humans are intrinsically lazy. So by highlighting and emphasizing something, m the market is, is, is just a bunch of humans. People are lazy. And you can start to get your narrative across, even if this narrative, in my, in my opinion, is quite wrong. So company A emphasized and showed normalized earnings number year on year for many years, and I'll show you the graphs now. Eventually, though, the norming, normal, normalized earnings like followed the earnings per share and the headline earnings, which were flat or falling over many of these periods. And why? Because you can only exclude costs so long when those costs are reoccurring and real, and then they come back to haunt you. Let me show you from company A's 2016 financial year, they had the following hidden quite deep in the disclosure, but it was there because it's a disclosure. Um, the definition of their normalized earnings. Normalized earnings is operating profit adjusted for depreciation, amortization of tangibles, lease smoothing, once off transaction costs. Before I even go on, operating profits, that's before interest and that's before tax, which I think are pretty real costs in my opinion. Um, I'll pay both of those, so why shouldn't, why shouldn't this company? 
And depreciation, I think, is a pretty real cost as well. You have fixed assets, they get worn out, and guess what? You depreciate them, and you have to buy more fixed assets. Mortalization of tangibles is a slightly more gray area. One can argue that. Lease smoothing is a bit technical. Once-off transaction costs, well, the question is, well, sure, maybe they did an acquisition that they were in their road. They decided that that's a, that lawyer fee is not part of their normal operations. But if for the last 10 years, every year, all they've been doing is buying companies, I would argue that that is actually the cost of doing business. Then this gets interesting. Previously, the group reported normalized earnings after adjusting for share-based payments, establishing costs relating to international operations. So what have they told you there? They've changed the definition of their normalized earnings this year because they didn't like last year's one. But they kept last, year, last year's one the same. This is company A. Yeah, is it in the dark color, dark blue, normalized earnings? You can see the trend line at the top over, and this is over many years. Normalized earnings is looking great. Headline earnings per share, the IFRS measure, which would include depreciation, amortization, lease smoothing, once-off transaction costs, all these nice things like interest and tax. Um, the headline earnings per share, the IFRS measure, there's often a big gap. And in fact, in many periods, like for example, you can see here that one went up. And normalized earning uh, and headline earnings per share actually went down. In fact, if you extrapolate the trend, headline earnings per share, the FRS measure is going down over this period, not up. So it actually paints two very different pictures. Normalized earnings shows a company that's growing and doing well. Headline earnings per share shows a company that's contracting and declining in profitability and arguably not doing well. And then reality hits this year. Eventually, those costs can't be excluded, and eventually, you know, all the, all the bad metaphors I can use about chickens coming home to roost and the like happen, and they both collapse. And in fact, headline earnings per share is a loss. What's interesting is normalized earnings per share, they still f found a way to manage to make it prof look like it's a profitable. Here's another interesting chart. We take this headline earnings per share and we look at uh, the difference between the two as a percentage. And you can see, because typically when companies adjust earnings, they will typically do it to show the company's profits look better. Uh, not always. There are some times when they don't. Um, but you, so, so normalized earnings per share is typically at a premium to headline earnings per share. And here you can see the premium itself is in fact rising. Yeah, at the bottom, is the uh, share price, well, the, yeah, the share price over years. And you can see the market is unsure and there's, there's bulls and there's bears buying and selling it, but it looks more and more stable. Things start to go wrong and the share price starts to collapse. And eventually, reality comes home to roost. Because if you keep changing the rules, but the costs are real, you, uh, it eventually comes out. So, my, my question is, now, this is just one example. And like I said, it's uh, about a fifth to a quarter of the JSC reports these adjusted earnings per share or adjusted earnings per share measures. So we, we have to get a handle on them. We have to know whether they're right or wrong and know how to look at them ourselves. So what are some kind of good and common rules here? I, I sat and thought about this, and I thought about how I look at these things, and I came up with a series of questions. A series of questions, if any of these are answered yes, it's probably not a very good earnings measure, and you probably shouldn't use this adjusted earnings measure that company's giving you. For example, is the cost real? That may sound like a funny question, but is the cost real? I'll show you, go back to this example here, where you have depreciation and amortization of intangibles. Now, depreciation is a fixed asset is getting worn out by use, and you eventually have to replace it. I think that's a real cost. But amortization of intangibles, that's, you know, you buy software, and you have to give it a useful life, and uh, you, you guys might have uh, on your computer Microsoft Office, your computer, your hardware will probably collapse and your hardware would be depreciated, but your software would be amortized. But, your, but by the end of your computer's useful life, your Microsoft Windows will probably still work just fine. 
So is it a real cost or isn't it? Um, that's perhaps a bad example, but you see what I mean. There are arguments for this way and that way. Um, so is it a real cost? And one of the ways we can work out if it's a real cost is, is someone paying the amount or is someone receiving the amount? And we go back to this definition here where they exclude share-based payments. Now, share-based payment is, a, is where often a management team has incentives. You go, if you hit these targets or if these things happen, we will give you um, option or you have options relating to these things and um, it's, it's, not, it's not quite a cash cost. The company hasn't, hasn't paid anything necessarily. Um, there's maybe some dilution to shareholders, so arguably all of us in the audience have perhaps paid that. But this is where I say you've got to ask those two questions together. Has someone paid it or has someone received it? management have definitely received the benefit of a share option. So, that, so someone's, someone's got the benefit of it, and hence that thing is very much real. Uh, so share options are quite real in my mind. You can't exclude them. Then the next one, is the cost repetitive or regular in occurrence? Once again, those share options. You have an incentive structure in place for management. That incentive structure, I assume, does not exist for only one year and then disappears, and then they never put another one back in. Management are there forever to run the company. So you expect that to be a very much reoccurring cost because you want to incentivize management to do well. So it's repetitive and reoccurring in nature. So why exclude it? Once again, those transaction fees on uh, acquisitions they made. Sure, if once in a blue moon you do an acquisition, maybe that's an outlying uh, cost. If every year you're doing multiple acquisitions, that is the cost of doing business. It is reoccurring and repetitive in nature. That should not be excluded. That is your cost of doing business. And then is it necessarily in the execution of a company's strategy or business? Um, there are costs that, for example, um, a company is doing business and a, it happens to have some foreign currency exposure and it goes against it and it reports a massive loss. Now, for many reasons, we could argue that that is in fact real, but let's ignore those questions for a moment. Now, if this company doesn't often do these sorts of transactions, I'd say that's a once-off once of events, not really necessarily to the company's cost of doing business. It was just a once-off overseas transaction. But if they're an importer or exporter, or they've got foreign operations, oh, I'm sorry, Forex is part of your business model. Manage that. The fact that you're incurring losses on it means that you are not managing that properly. So I have spent quite a bit of time on this adjusted earnings. I'll skip to some probably softer measures, um, but I thought it was quite important because this is a growing prevalence on the stock market, these adjusted earnings measures. We need to have rules to identify them. And there are good ones. There are ones that I use and, and I don't discard. Jumping on to the next one, we have what I call acquisitive growth magic. Now this lies squarely in IFRS. This is not just 100% legal, this is 100% comparable, consistent, and audited. But is it very well disclosed? So if risk accounting rules dictate that when a company buys another company, from the moment it has control of that company, it consolidates its earnings into the holding company. So if I have a company and halfway through the year I buy another company, um, I put those earnings into mine and at the end of the year I disclose both sets of earnings as one as the group earnings. And guess what? Because it's assuming both companies have had flat earnings, at the end of the year, the odds are, assuming I've done it, uh, done it smartly, you know, uh, minimize my finance charges and blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to get into that technicality. But two companies are, are, are consolidated. Those profits will be up. Because, and is that company doing well? Is it doing badly? Well, I just told you how it's doing. It's actually flat. Both both companies are flat, their earnings are flat, the revenues are flat, they're exactly static, but you've reported earnings that are up. That's acquisitive growth. Now bear in mind in this example, this hypothetical example, I told you I bought it halfway through the year. So I actually only account for six months of the second company's earnings. 
next year account for 12 months. So guess what? My earnings look great this year and they look great next year because it grows next year as well. And both companies over both years are flat. So actually in the background, not, nothing is growing, nothing is happening. This is acquisitive growth magic, I call it. There's nothing wrong with it. You can make good businesses. Um, smart acquisitions can build groups very fast, can entrench competitive advantages, can extract synergies, and I can rattle off a whole lot of other like uh, esoteric business terms that sound really fancy, but one has to ask this question. On, on the JSE, when companies do these acquisitions and they report their results, do they properly disclose the acquisitions? Not by, hey, I bought this company, but by, hey, I bought this company, I paid this much. It generated this much profit on its own. Our cost of that was that, and our dilution from that was that. So in fact, our acquisitive growth for this period was this much. So if you reverse that, you can see the core underlying business because they've given you enough detail to reverse engineer those accounts and work out how the underlying businesses are doing. So is it properly disclosed? Does it make sense? Are they just buying things for the sake of buying things? Because as you compound earnings, markets love it, shares ramp up, and then you can buy more things. And eventually that house of cards always falls down, but you can, you can kick the bucket down the, the can down the road quite far. Um, but like I said, if you have those those two elements, especially the disclosure that's correct, not just saying, hey, we bought it, but giving enough detail, you can unpack it and work out if the existing companies are still organically growing. Why is this important? This is important for this reason. Now, this company I actually invested in, and it, it, it hurt me quite a bit, probably mostly my ego. But uh, that's, that's life in the market. You don't get all of them right. Uh, so the, the background on Company B was a new management team walked into Company B. It was failing on the JSE. It was all sorts of problems. New management team rocks up, takes a stake in it, turns it around, uses its script to subsequently capital raise, and then starts to buy other companies that at first make a lot of sense within the group. It, um, it was an industrial group of companies. But as it buys these companies, obviously its earnings reported are better. So guess what? The share price responds and goes up. So they can use that higher share price to buy other companies so that, guess what? Next reporting period, its earnings are up again. What happened was in the background, my sense of things was they were not running the companies they had bought properly. So what was happening was they were acquiring companies fast enough and they, like I said, everything is within context. There were some macro tailwinds that were helping them. But the moment the macro headwinds came and, and the tide went out, you got to see in stark contrast the fact that these guys, over this period on the bottom chart, that were, this is the share price, were buying companies. This is the period where they stopped buying companies, the macro tailwinds start to hit, and then you start to see the organic growth rate. It's not positive, it is negative. In fact, they haven't added value from the companies they've bought, they've detracted value. So the complete opposite happens. The share price starts to fall, they can't make acquisitions, while well, in the background the companies they've bought are doing worse, so the results they post are worse, so the share price falls, so they can't buy companies, and so the whole positive feedback cycle becomes a negative feedback cycle. And this one demonstrates acquisitive growth, exactly what not to do very, very well. And like I said, I, I was caught in this one, uh, and uh, that's why you diversify, because you're not always right. Then I'll jump to what I call shifting revenues and costs. And ultimately, shifting revenues and costs is the same thing. You are massaging profits. Now, Ephraim recognizes revenue and risk and reward for the provision of services or product transfers. It's a very simple way of saying, if I give you something, the moment I give it to you and it's your responsibility, you can, re you can recognize the revenue from it. it's transferred. Uh, likewise with costs, the cruel, uh, the cruel basis of accounting is that you account for costs, 
when they are incurred, not when cash flows. Uh, sorry, that was the other important uh, uh, note here. You recognize revenue and risk and reward transfers not when cash transfers. That's why we have debtors and creditors, because they're the matching entries for when cash transfers. Now, that sounds straightforward, right? In some instances, it isn't. And in this instance, and like I said, this is IFRS, but it's the part of IFRS that uses assumptions and estimates. And there are some transactions where it is not exactly clear either how much cost you've incurred or how much revenue you have earned. So one has to use estimates. And it's not to say management is uh, unethical. Sometimes they can just be inaccurate. But I'll give you some examples. Bankers and credit providers, when they make a loan, have to estimate the bad debts before they're incurred because you've got to match your revenue with your costs. Construction pro uh, projects. You have a five-year construction project to build a massive stadium. Well, you're reporting every six months. You've actually, as you're doing that project, you've got to be estimating, it's called the percentage completion uh, method of accounting for construction contracts, where you say, hey, I think at the end of this period, I'm 20% done. So I'm going to recognize 20% of revenue and 20% of my costs. Now that sounds great until you reach the point where you go, uh, recognize, you've recognized 100% of revenues and 100% of costs, but you're not actually done with the contract and that stadium's not actually built, then you've got a problem. But these are estimates and assumptions. One has to use them. Um, long lead time services, that's the same as construction projects. How do you recognize those things over multi-year periods? Insurance contracts, think about it. You pay your insurance premiums. How does it, your insurer account for that? Well, he goes, you're a great guy. I'll take your insurance premium. I estimate that you're going to uh, claim X amount over the next couple of years, over the lifetime of this insurance contract, and they try to match those costs. That's an incredibly simplified way of doing it, and it's incredibly complex, particularly. That's th that particularly keeps uh, lots of actuaries still employed. Um, but all of those are estimates, and they, in the, the one thing about estimates and assumptions is that ultimately, they will either be right or wrong because reality comes along and at the end of your five years when you recognize 100% of your revenues and costs on your construction contract, you are either done building that stadium or you are not. When you make that loan, at the end of the loan life, either the guy has defaulted along the way or he has not. So all of these estimates and assumptions will get proved in time right or wrong but it's the nature of the beast that you have to make them ahead of time. Um, so let me give you some examples of how those estimates that many, many, many companies make these in good faith, but how these estimates and assumptions can be shifted around to, like I said, smooth profits. So Company C reported the other day, and Company C sells houses. You walk in, you go, geez, I like uh, the look of that uh, house that you're going to build. Here's my deposit. I will buy it. They go, great, I will build it for you. They build it. Then, assuming you've had your bond approved, you move in, and when, when the transfer goes through the bond, the banks pay them. And they walk away, you've got a house, the banks have got a mortgage, and they've sold a house and made profit because they've sold it for a higher price than they took to construct it. So how do you recognize that revenue? It sounds simple enough. Have a look at FY17 where they changed the revenue recognition a policy. I call it policy, but they did this by changing accounting estimate, which means you don't have to retrospectively adjust it, which means they didn't have to restate the prior year. I'm still not entirely certain how they got this through, um, but they did. It happened. Um, now, the old policy, the old policy in prior years was the company only recognized revenue on the registration of transfer in the deeds office and not on the sale. Not on the moment you have an approved bond, you've paid your deposit and you've signed, and there is no way for you to walk out of there. 
that, that's not when they recognize it. They recognize it when the bond flows, i.e. when the transfer of the house happens, because then there is absolutely zero risk. And I promise you, as watertight as you may think your approved bonds are, the banks will always have a clause where if something happens, they can pull it at the last moment. Till that money flows, it is not in the bank. Um, the new policy recognizes revenue on the earlier of registration at deeds office, which is the same as that, or occupation with guarantees in place. Now, I don't think it's very often you buy a house and you move into it before you own it, uh, particularly when it's still being built. Um, so I don't think, I think when they say earlier, they're leaving the window a little open, but 99% of the time, I suspect that occupation happens when you assign the bonds approved and everything, and uh, they're waiting for the transfer to go through. Sounds like a very small detail. Uh, like, uh, I, I just sold a house and just bought a house. Uh, we, we've, uh, me and my wife have just moved uh, homes, and uh, both transfers look like they've taken about 10 to 15 days. That sounds like a very small window. In the course of a financial year, almost all of those would have gone through by then. But at financial year end, that's 10 to 15 days of window of things that are hanging between old policy to new policy. So what is the actual effect? And here's, here's where it gets interesting. The effect will, in, uh, by my workings, you can find that in debtors. Because that is the sales you made where you have not received the cash. So the change in debtors across those periods is the difference between these two policies. And on company C's change in debtors, it's 601 million rand of revenue that they recognize now because of the change in policy. That's 20% of their total turnover. In fact, their earnings were shown to be growing. Their HEPs, IFRS HEPs, were shown to be growing at 7% year on year. But the moment I take their old policy and I apply it and I reverse that at an average GP margin and the like, their HEPs would have actually come out as falling 11%. So by changing that policy or that assumption and estimate, they have changed the entire narrative of their company to the market from hey, like, you know, profits are down, we're struggling, it's a bit tough, too. We're still growing, we're amazing. Very, very different. This one, I will use their name. Uh, African Bank. So I, I suspect most people in this room know uh, what African Bank did. They lent out money. Um, this is an incredibly simplified one because there are a lot more uh, reasons why African Bank failed. But... Um, pretty much their profits were the interest and other revenues on lending money, um, less the interest that they needed to borrow to lend that money. So there was the interest margin, the gap between the two, borrow at 5%, lend at 50,000%. Um, and here's the important one, bad debts. Now the bad debts, like I said, is actually an assumption because when you recognize that right up front and over time, you have to recognize that bad debts before it happens. This is where they, like the key part of the business model fell down was their bad debts were underestimated. And it came back to haunt them because eventually those debts go bad and there is no way to hide them and you have to declare them. And that goes through your income statement and you turn from massive profits into massive losses. So... By understating, in the short term, by understating bad debts, African Bank effectively, be it intentionally or unintentionally, who, who knows, um, underestimated its bad debts, but overestimated its profits. And that means it came back to haunt it. It had big losses. The losses became reality, and the rest is history because no one lent money to it, and it all ground to a halt. Um, so that's another, that's an example of where the, so, this example happened this year. This one hasn't come back to haunt them yet. Um, and who knows, maybe it won't. Maybe their change in policy is correct and I'm full of rubbish. African Bank came back to haunt them. And that's a very good example of where estimates and assumptions can be wrong. So then we arrive at window dressing cash flows. You guys all would have heard, and every great investor and fund manager stands up here and tells you, cash is king. Look at the cash flow statement. 
There is, and or even auditors will tell you, there is no way cash flow statements can lie. Well, we will ignore the fact that a massive multinational European dairy business faked its cash balances at the banks by faxing fake bank statements to the auditors. But that's changed policies, and that was many years ago. So they literally lied about their cash, and that really uh, was uh, cash, cash lying. But cash is not always king, and cash can be misleading. So what is working capital? Working capital is your debtors, your inventory, and your creditors. So what uh, now on the JSE, companies report every six months. So we only get that snapshot through into exactly on the ground how the finances of a company look every six months on the JSC. So we don't see what happens between those periods. But what can happen towards year end or reporting the period close is, for example, and in this case, my example is the entire retail sector. And by the way, this is perfectly legal and actually quite moral but it's also not a true representation on actually how the businesses are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that's why I've, in, I've included it. But have a look at period end and year end for retailers and have a walk down to any one of their stores. Suddenly, there are massive sales of stock discounted down. And in fact, if you're a debtor there, that's a good opportune time to rock up and to say, hey, can I settle my debts? In fact, can you give me a discount? And they'll probably say yes. Because, um, and you, at that time, you'd hate to be a creditor, uh, a supplier into these uh, retail companies, because the way you make your cash balance look fantastic and your cash generation look great at reporting period end is on the 31st of December, if you're December year end, you've sold all your stock, your debtors have all paid you, and you've told all your creditors, hey, I'll pay you tomorrow. And your cash balance looks great, there's a snapshot made of all your financials, you report it to the market, and then on the 1st of January, you go and buy a whole lot of stock, you put it on the floor, um, you tell all your debtors, no, late, uh, like, you know, you're charging you interest, you, you, like, no, no early discounts, and you pay all your creditors so they carry on supplying you. Now, that's perfectly legal, that's IFRS compliant, but is that reflective of a day-by-day -day operation? It isn't. It's window dressing, cash flows. Then we get investment holding fair values. Now, there's lots of listed investment companies on the JSE. Um, and some of them do great. Uh, there, some of them have fantastic investments. Some of their management are great capital allocators. Um, but there's a very big difference between, if you look at the bottom, sum of parts and NAV. Sum of parts is not IFRS. Sum of parts is management constructed and sometimes analyst and fund manager constructed. NAV is management constructed, but even within NAV, you can change the look and feel of NAV by changing the fair values of the companies that you own, particularly if they're unlisted. Um, so investment holding companies do have this kind of discretion to display their assets how they want. And like I said, they don't in terms of IFRS in NAV, they do in terms of some of parts because it's not audited, but they have every incentive to overstate them. And it's particularly easy to overstate them even in terms of IFRS. If you have a weak or compliant auditor, or you can find a way to justify for an unlisted investment why it's actually worth more than it probably is worth. So you just half the valuation. Listed investment is much harder because you take the number of shares, you take the share price, and bang, you've got the fair value. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples here. Now, Company D, you can see this graph to the right of Company D. Company D has a whole lot of investments, some of them listed, some of them unlisted. But it charges a lot of them management fees for the privilege of being invested in them and the expertise that this incredible management team brings. And they actually are like a really smart bunch of uh, people. But those management fees actually make the group at a group level profitable because it's extracting cash flows and profits from these underlying businesses. So in this case, the group is actually a profit center. But how do you disclose that? Now, Company D 
has its nav and an IFRA statements, and they're disclosed and they're there, but they don't emphasize them. In fact, they stand up in public and say how, how junk they are because IFRS doesn't, doesn't represent their business. They talk about summer parts. And their summer parts, they value group. And they actually give group a value. And what is interesting is over many years, the methodology on which they valued group has changed. In fact, they went through a period where they did not value group. Then they said, hey, actually, we're making profits here. So they started valuing group. Then they said, you know what? We should value group on about a 10 times multiple, if I remember correctly. And then they quietly changed that to, no, we need to value it on a market representative basis. Now, I understand that by the all or top 40 price earnings. So you go from a 10 times multiple to a 19 times. Can you see the step change? This is just the value of group function. Now, group had been growing in the background, and group had been doing well. Had it been doing that well, and particularly between these two years, did it really change that much? No, the methodology changed. So they make the nav look better. Well, they make the summer parts at least look better. And they stand up and they go, we're incredible. Strip out that change, and it was a relatively mediocre result over that period. Uh, then you get company E is another one. Disclose the major investment at cost and not at market value. And that, what was interesting was, at cost, it was a listed business. So it was easy to check what the fair value was. Um, and they paid far more for it than its shares were worth in the market because its shares had tumbled down. But they just stated it at cost. So it obviously propped the nav up. They have subsequently changed that. Company F is another one. It valued a subsidiary for millions of rands. It was an unlisted subsidiary that did, to this day, I'm still not quite sure what it did. Um, never turned a cent of profit, but they gave it millions of fair value because it had all sorts of optionality and credible RP in it. But for many years, eventually, it's actually got to make a profit. Um, none of these things actually added real economic value. All of them were changes and manipulations and shifting of disclosure. Then I get to other means of misleading. This one I'm going to run through. Segmental reclassification, you take a group as a whole lot of businesses, some of them are profitable, some of them are loss making, you have segments so you cluster them together and in fact if, if one segment is doing worse than another one or if a company is making a loss you can start to shift them across the segments and move them and you just quietly slip it into disclosure somewhere if you're really, really nice, some of them I suspect don't even do that. Um, so that you actually hide the loss-making ones and you make your segments look better. Or even worse, the one that frustrates me the most, change your segments. From this year to that year, go, oh, no, we've got new segments, so you can't compare these segments to those ones. But you go, but your businesses are the same. You haven't changed your businesses. It's shifting things around. Selective highlights and results, ignoring the bad news. Like I said, the very first exa example, company A, normalized earnings up. It would have been a very different highlight if they said headline earnings down. Like, the world is lazy. People are lazy. Investors are lazy. Accept that. And you can manipulate that by manipulating where you put things in, in results. Quoting percentage change where things are growing, but hiding percentage change when things are declining. Not putting in comparatives when things are down. Have a look at the construction sector. Suddenly, no one is quoting their construction order book of last year. You have to go and dig to find that. Everyone's got, I've got a six billion order book. You go, uh, okay, but what was it last year? Um, no, I'm not going to tell you in these results. So you go and open last year's results, oh, it was 6.5 billion. You've actually gone down. You see, if you don't ask these questions, uh, they, uh, no, no one, they just don't, management not going to come out and tell you I've done a bad job because their, their jobs and their livelihood is online. So you have to have skepticism here. Sticking balance sheets before income statements, that goes to selective highlights. Sounds like a very small thing, but if you've got a shocking set of results, but a good balance sheet and fantastic net asset value, stick your balance sheet before your income statement, and you hope the market reads only your balance sheet and not your income statement. Moving management targets around to fit your, fit, like suits what you've achieved. You go, uh, my target this year was always to make headline earnings per share grow only by 10%. You go back five years and actually their target was 
but it started slipping. So instead of going, hey, we're failing, they've changed their targets to suit reality, instead of changing reality to meet their targets. Constructing a great narrative as a strategy, but executing something totally different. Over the last couple of years, there's a company I spent a lot of time with, and their narrative was fantastic. They're going to consolidate and extract value from an ener a portfolio of energy-related businesses. And then they did a massive transaction of an industrial logistics company, and their narrative changed. And you go, this is totally different to what you've been telling me. But then suddenly they won't go back and tell you, oh, um, our strategy changed. They go, no, 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 this was always our strategy. Um, overstrating provisions in bad years to release them in good years, smoothing. I mean, we've touched on that in the previous ones. Only disclosing select periods and graphs that fit management narrative and changing graphs to create illusions of change. This is sleight of hand. Let me show you it. On this one, we've got smooth revenue growth. On this one, aggressively growing revenue. Fantastic ramp up. This one's a bit chaotic. It's been a tough period. They've recovered. And that one, once again, smooth revenue growth. Do you know every single one of those graphs is exactly the same data? Here, to make this one look like that, I chopped out the scale. You see that scale only starts at 9. So that one drops down. And then that scale only goes to 12. So that one stretches up. So guess what? Your angle is much sharper, and suddenly your narrative that we're a growing company looks like you're totally on form, and what you're saying is accurate. Now, how I made these two look the same was I just ignored those years. This one only starts at FY14. If I was standing up as an executive, I'd say, we've been growing nicely. It's been tough but challenging period, but we've managed to extract growth, or the usual uh, euphemisms for uh, corporatees. I would exclude those, because the moment you include those, actually, you haven't been growing. FY14 was a disaster, and you've been recovering. And I just did that by forgetting my time period. Well, just chop that out. It doesn't suit my narrative, so I'll change it. It's this, not, none of this is illegal. None of this is audited, in many cases, especially in results presentations. They're not audited, the graphs, the scales. There is no standard you need to use a 10 by, 10 by 1 graph. It's got to be 10 time periods. It's got to be. So guys, choose their time periods. Understand, when you're dealing with a management team of a listed company, you're dealing with guys who are there because they're smart. They know how to talk. They know how to sell themselves. And they know how to make the data look like their narrative. So disclosure versus cons uh, transparency. This is where I'd like to use an example. My wife comes to me and says, we should buy a new house. Can we afford one? So I go, yes, we can afford one. Now, if I can't afford one, I've lied to her. In terms of this presentation, that would be fraud. If I go to her, yes, we can afford a new house, and I actually can afford a new house, that would be disclosure. I've told the truth but I've only told the bare minimum of the truth. If I go to her, yes, we can afford a new house, but if the interest rate doubles, we're going to have a problem, and I think we should sell the old one. In fact, here's my financial situation, and let's see how we can make this work. That's transparency. I've not just disclosed, I've given you enough information to form a balanced picture. If it says bare minimum disclosure requirements, and some of them are, are actually quite intense, but, uh, and, and, and it's for a good cause. But bad companies hide behind these requirements. They either use them for bare minimum disclosure and don't show you anything more. They tuck facts, important facts, into lengthy accounting notes that should be highlights, not hidden. Because, you see, that's the irony about disclosure. If you tuck it into a note far and apart and it comes out later that, hey, no one knew this was happening, you could go, no, 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 I'll put that in note 27B clause 3 down the bottom. It's there. And legally, you're covered. But is it ethical? And then they can also argue how IFRS is wrong and window address their own numbers, adjusted earnings and the like. We've gone through that. Good companies 
obviously follow IFRS because that's what a good company does, but volunteer disclosure. Like I said, there is a big difference between transparency and disclosure. So then we get to narrative and reality. A bad company's narrative doesn't equal its numbers. Good company's narrative ultimately is backed up by the numbers. Look for that. Look for signs of management that have uh, achievable, quantifiable guidance, they meet their targets and are regularly achieved. Rule of thumb, if management says something is happening, double check that it's happening in the numbers. I think I'm running out of time because I see Simon standing up. So I'm, I'm gonna shoot through this. The first question is, shouldn't the auditors and JSC and everything check this out? No, actually not. The auditors are external to the company. I'll never know as much as the company. They audit on the sample basis. They audit on material, materiality. That's what a sample basis is, eff effectively. They audit according to IFRS, um, and they're not investors. They also rely on management for estimates, guidelines, and policies, and they do not always audit the extra information or the results presentations, all the articles, all the PR, all the investor relations that the company puts out that emphasizes and creates its narrative. So no. The auditors do a very good job at looking for efforts, but they're not there to protect you from uh, misleading and bias uh, management. The JSC checks if you follow the rules, and the FSB checks if you follow the rules. If you follow the rules, that's fine. It's not about the spirit of the law, it's about the law. Um, so it's ultimately all up to you. You've got to be aware and conscious, uh, conscious of this. That's why I have my golden rule, incentive is that the best incentive in the world is management who are shareholders because then they're the same as you. They won't window dress things. It will actually be the way it is because they're invested alongside you. The worst incentive in the world is a professional manager with a salary and a cash-based short-term bonus because he can manipulate stuff, flip it, make it look great, gets his cash out, gets his bonus, and he's gone in a year or two's time and it's someone else's problem. It's your problem as the shareholder. So, in summary, there's many ways management can legally mislead you, sometimes unwittingly, sometimes very, very precisely and intentionally. Um, none of them are legal, but many of them, especially if it's intentional, is morally misleading, and if it's unintentional, you've just got to question the confidence of management. Um, and you can't rely on auditors and regulators to protect you, so some healthy cynicism research is probably your best uh, defense against this along with looking at management's incentive. So sorry guys, questions, I, I know that was a little long and uh, I was hoping to leave a lot more uh, space for questions but I'll be here afterwards as well. Yeah, ladies and gents, I'm going to park it there because we have had time and I appreciate people, places to go and things to do. Uh, but Keith will be around, you can find him on the Twitters and the like as well if you've got questions. I just remember